Good evening. Thanks for making it out tonight. It's actually our second political series this month, and considering that there are only three days <laughs> into the month, we've been busy. But that's understandable, right? But joining us last minute is Danny Schechter. A little bit about him. He's known as the news dissector. Schechter has spent decades working in the media, in print, radio, local news, cable news, CNN, CNNBC, network news magazines, and as an independent filmmaker and TV producer. He will be <laughs> moderating tonight, and he will be giving a proper introduction to Mr. Matt Taibbi. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Danny Schechter. I like that. I haven't had an introduction like that uh, since I was being booed in Boston some years ago. I, I just wanted to say I'm here representing the Honorable Mark Crispin Miller uh, from NYU, the great media ecologist and analyst who usually runs uh, these sessions, uh, the political nights at this lovely bookstore. But uh, he has run afoul of a, a problem that family people often have. The babysitter disappeared for tonight. And in uh, his stead, he invited me to come and uh, basically introduce Matt and try to moderate uh, if there is a debate or, or, or battle here. Uh, as Matt goes into discussing his book, I just want to you know, say something, that there are a lot of people who are financial journalists and, and analysts, and I sort of uh, try to be one myself with a new film called Plunder, The Crime of Our Time, which is probably why Mark invited me to be here. But I think uh, I have to defer to the man who compared Goldman Sachs to a giant vampire squid on the face of humanity. And it gets better than that in his new book, which is laced with a kind of personal uh, animus of a very creative type in which he also describes uh, the reception that some of his work uh, received from some of the brilliant minds uh, and basically uh, Wall Street tools who are working in the media, uh, one of whom you know, uh, pounced all over him and then basically agreed with everything he said but just didn't like the fact that he was saying it. And he was uh, soon rewarded uh, in the transition from CNBC to Fox News. Uh, Charles Gasparino. So, uh, you know, Matt not only writes about this, but he writes about the impact of his work and the, the way in which a lot of ideas tend to get distorted by the people who are the guardians and the, you know, who are running the foxes who are running, guarding the hen house on Wall Street. And I think uh, Matt's been brilliantly able to not only critique it, but win a, a, a worldwide audience, both through Rolling Stone, his books, his presence in the media. And I'm really glad he's here. I, I knew his father in Boston in the media, which dates me. But I, I have to say, Matt has uh, brought Rolling Stone back uh, to being a, a publication uh, that you know practices the gonzo. I think Hunter Thompson would be proud. But beyond that, I think we need to listen to what he has to say. I wanted, you're going to talk about your book, but we, we can't ignore uh, the time that are in our lives that this is taking place. The election uh, that, that uh, ended yesterday in a catastrophic defeat, in my view, for democracy. And today, the latest bailout from the Federal Reserve Bank uh, to the tune of $600 billion. Our president saying he felt bad. Uh, he was shellacked but he wants to work with the people who brought him down. So I wanted maybe to start, Matt, if you wouldn't mind just sharing your reactions to uh, this election, and, and uh, then let's segue into the content of your book, uh, which is called Griftopia. He's talking about the grifting class uh, that dominates uh, finance in our country and dominates our country through finance. Matt. First of all, I just wanted to say thank you, Danny, for very much for coming and on, the, on short notices. It's really much appreciated, uh, and it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, I also just want to thank the folks at McNally Jackson. Uh, before I started, I did my last uh, launch party here, and they've always been great to me. And they're an independent bookstore, and we need to support those. And uh, they're great at what they do. Obviously, the people at uh, at Spiegel and Growl, also I, uh, you know, Cindy and Julie and Karen and Chris Jackson, who should be here at some point, 
uh, also has a babysitter issue. Uh, I just wanted to say thanks to all those folks before we get started because um, you know this book is, is obviously, as you know, a really difficult one, and it, it took a lot of uh, work on everybody's part. Um, the election today, uh, y yesterday, um, obviously, I, it's just some of the results were really scary. I have a slightly different um, take on it than than other people. I thought what I was really paying attention to wasn't so much the, the seats that the Republicans gained, but um, the ones uh, where they should have won and they didn't. I'm looking mostly at Delaware and Nevada and places like that. And I think what happened yesterday, to me, the, the dominant storyline is that the Tea Party has now announced itself as really uh, the kingmaker uh, of the Republican Party. And it's going to be impossible going forward in the wake of these results for for them to nominate anybody in 2012 who isn't acceptable to this demographic because they now they now really rule the party and I don't know what you think but it, it, to me that's that's going to be problematic for them going forward I think uh, you know what we've seen is that some of the the Tea Party wins that in the primary season this year ended up being losses for them if they had, if they had just nominated a, a, a slightly less insane kind of <laughs> candidate than somebody like Christine O'Donnell or Sharon Angle, uh, they probably would have taken those states. And we're, I think we're going to see those divisions again in, in a couple of years. But what about, what about this whole thing, though, where, where, you know, their whole argument, you know, the bailouts, the big government, the, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, government is, is that they're, they're taking back. And yet today, here we had a Republican Mr. Bernanke mm -hmm. announcing a $600 billion bailout, which was called an easing. Uh, oh, quantitative QE, QE, they QE, did that today? Yeah. Okay. And, yeah. you know, so here we had, the, you know, it was really a disguised stimulus uh, plan, wouldn't you say? I mean, yeah, no, quantitative easing is worse than a stimulus because it's not real money. It's uh, quantitative easing, for those of you who don't know, is, is um, it's a program that the Fed cooked up. They did it. They've already done it once, uh, a couple of years ago, where they simply printed a trillion and a half dollars out of thin air and used it to buy assets, uh, which typically were mortgages or treasury bonds. Uh, and you know, what makes it different from something like the stimulus? The stimulus is money that was actually in sitting in the treasury. This is they just literally did the Aladdin, I dream of genie thing and snapped their fingers and made this money, and they're going to inject it into the bloodstream of the economy. But of course, the, this is really going to primarily benefit all the Wall Street companies. The, the last time around, uh, QE, the first QE, quantitative easing, was used basically to buy mortgages, and that propped up the mortgage market and helped a lot of these banks that had bad assets on their books um, dump it all on the government. Uh, and we're going to see more of the same this time around. It's, it's, it's really an artificial way to prop up the mortgage-backed securities market and prevent the losses that really are already on the books of these banks uh, from being recognized. It's re all, all this is really going to do is prevent the proverbial shit from hitting the fan for a couple of years. Well, you know, in, in your book you talk about going out, I think, to Nevada and trying to talk with some people out there about the financial crisis and getting a, a reaction uh, that could be summarized in one word. Duh. You know, <laughs> uh, and when I worked at ABC News, we had a phrase called MIGO, which stands for my eyes glaze over <laughs> when, whenever I hear talk of a financial crisis. And yet, somehow you kind of decided you weren't deterred. You decided this was a story worth following. How did you follow it and what what did you learn? And that's what's in your book, in part, you know. Yeah, I tell the story in the book. The, the, the sort of genesis of all this was when I was covering the campaign uh, in 2008, and I was on the campaign trail uh, following John McCain. And we were in, I think the town was Kenner, Louisiana, somewhere outside of New Orleans. And everyone remember the whole drill, baby, drill thing? Everybody remembers that. McCain was up on this, uh, you know, on the, on the lectern. And he was really belting that one out uh, that night. He was talking about how the, the reason for the spike in gas prices in 2008 was that the Democrats had prevented uh, the Republicans from drilling both in the Alaskan National Wild Wildlife Preserve and the, and the Gulf of Mexico. So he gives a speech, you know, r rousing applause in this Republican audience, and then we, the press all files back to its, 
you know, it's a cage in the airplane. And, uh, and the reporters who are always picking on the candidates behind their back, and to their face it's always different, but behind their backs, uh, this one guy was sort of laughing, the television reporter saying, well, as if, you know, McCain, what, a, what an idiot, as if not drilling in the Gulf of Mexico is what's causing this spike in gas prices. And I kind of looked around and said, do we actually know what's causing the spike in gas prices? And it was sort of like a cartoon, you know, heard the crickets, you know, no, nobody knew, I didn't know. And you know, this other reporter leaned over to me and said, uh, you haven't figured out that we're all frauds yet? Uh, <laughs> And just to go into a bit of a long-winded answer, after that, uh, I wasn't really assigned that story or anything, but I, I made a couple of phone calls because I was sort of panicking at that point that I was going to be writing about something that I didn't know about. And uh, the first couple of calls that I made, uh, I found out that oil supply was actually up that year and, and demand was down. So gas prices should have been going down that year, uh, but they were instead going up. And that led to this whole thing where I, I, I did this investigation and I found out that the commodities market was tightly, was tightly regulated, had been since the 30s. They had a, a limit that had been placed on the amount of speculative money in the commodities market. You, they want most of the people in the commodities market to be actually consuming, using those uh, commodities like corn, gas, you know, soybeans, wheat, all those things. They didn't want speculators to come in and buy the whole market and then artificially jack up the prices. So that was tightly regulated for five, six decades. And then in the early 90s, these Wall Street companies like Goldman Sachs quietly started applying to the government and asking for exemptions. They said, we're speculators, but we'd like to be treated as what they call physical hedgers. Um, and so they started handing out these exemptions. And over the course of 15 or 18 years, they handed out 16 or 17 of these exemptions. And before you knew it, uh, in 2001, there was $13 billion of speculative money in the commodities market. By 2007, there was over $200 billion in, this, in the commodities market. And unlike the stock market, where you can bet for or against stocks, in commodities, you can, it's really all what they call long money. It's, it's, either, it's not long or short. It's all long. When you're, when you're buying commodities, you're betting on the price of it to go up. And so when you, have the, you pour this enormous amount of money, into the commodities market, it artificially drives the price of gas up. So that's the long-winded answer of what happened in 2008. And the fascinating thing to me was that neither of the candidates was talking about this. We had McCain's drill baby drill explanation on the one hand, and then we had Obama saying we all need to drive hybrid cars on the other hand. And this big unexplained mystery was, was sort of left for somebody to but what I, like, what I like about what you did, you introduced into this discussion of commodity prices. Probably if we announced tonight we would have a forum on commodity prices, I would uh, Migo. suspect no one would be here. Okay, <laughs> But you, you also go a step further and talk about the consequences of this kind of speculation, namely that people died. That millions of people w found that they life unaffordable. If you were living on two dollars a day, now you were living on one dollar a day or one dollar a day's worth of purchasing power. I mean, I think that is is the missing link in a lot of the writing about the, the financial crisis. What is it actually? Of how does it actually affect people? We know it affects people who are being foreclosed upon, but it's not just them. Yeah, the, the, it's really interesting. I was. When I was doing the commodity stuff, I was talking to this one oil analyst uh, who was a Saudi uh, gentleman, but he was very smart, very interesting, and gave me a lot of time. And as he was describing what had gone on in the oil markets, he also casually mentioned that the prices of, uh, there are 25 commodities in the Goldman Sachs Commodities Index, and again, they include things like corn, wheat, soybean, that, that sort of thing. He said all 25 commodities, the price of them all individually went up every year from 2005 on, which of course had never happened before in history. And he kind of casually th threw out to me that, oh, and by the way, because of that, an additional 500 million people around the world uh, joined the ranks of the poor uh, in the year 2008, according to, uh, I guess it was the WHO or something like that. And that was a sort of a, a casual aside in, in our conversation uh, because food prices had gone up. And, and uh, when they were, the hunger story was reported that year, I went back and looked. It was, again, all 
treat it as a supply and demand issue, a normal market forces issue, and nobody talked about the fact that this was purely a, a Wall Street casino issue, that it cost all these people in Bangladesh and in Africa to, to go hungry. It's a crazy story. And yet, underreported if reported at all. I mean, so when you start reporting this stuff, people look at what you're doing and think you're whacked. It, you know, the, we quickly figured out at Rolling Stone that this was this whole territory of stuff that nobody was talking about because the financial press, the people who do understand this stuff, who cover this stuff for a living, um, they're mostly writing for audiences that are in the business. Uh, if you pick up the Wall Street Journal or you watch CNBC and you see all those incomprehensible numbers flying across the screen all day long, uh, it's kind of like watching ESPN. ESPN is not for people who don't like sports. Uh, it's for people who know what a, what a zone blitz is or whatever. Uh, they're not going to explain to you the rules of football every time you turn on television. And that's, that's the way the financial press operates. They don't stop and, and, and back up and explain it to ordinary people. That's not their mandate. And, and I think in the process of not talking to ordinary people over, the, over so many years, I think that a lot of the financial reporters lost their perspective. They lost their ability to see the consequences of what went on, and that's, that's how they missed it, I thought. I, I wanted to ask you about one of those financial reporters, but in a second, because one of the things I, I discovered back there on page 16B on the business section in the bottom, in the back where the shipping news is, there was a little report that uh, reported that three point eight billion dollars in advertising uh, was poured into the internet uh, radio and television by lending lo lending companies financial institutions uh, and credit card companies between 2002 and 2007 so could this have anything to do with the lack of coverage absolutely I, I think you know just look at the names on the stadiums in, in the in the in the last decade you know ameriquest uh you know, the, the, I don't know if there was a countrywide stadium. There probably was somewhere. But all these fly-by-night mortgage companies popped up all over the country, and they gained instant credibility everywhere. Uh, they, were, they were advertisers in every single market. The credit card companies obviously dominate television advertising. Uh, and I, I, I absolutely think it had an effect on, on coverage in, in a lot of places, because they're the only people who really were that liquid to, you know, to support advertising. So the media doesn't really cover the media. Uh, in fact, that's maybe why there was such a negative reaction in many mainstream newspapers to the John Stewart rally, because he critiqued uh, media coverage, and they felt like, oh, he's attacking the messenger. He's not really focusing on the message. But when we think Tea Party, we think of some, you know, uh, old lady with a, you know, maybe with a uh, one of those weird hats, you know, talking about big government, and yet. The Tea Party phenomena was kicked off by a media person right. uh, named Rick Santelli on CNBC. Talk about that because you're one of the few people who really zoned in on this that, and what the content of what he said was. Yeah, that, the famous Rick Santelli. How many people here saw that rant on, uh, on the internet? The, the amazing thing about that, there are, there are a bunch of things that were amazing about it, but uh, <laughs> This was in, what, February 2009, right? Uh, at that point, there had already been trillions of dollars in bailout money spent, uh, and they'd all gone to directly to supporting the big banks, the very companies that got us into the, 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 the financial crisis. All that money had been spent, and most of the, the people who are now Tea Partiers were basically quiet about it. They, they didn't have, I mean, there were, there were some uh, ideological objections to the bailout, but there wasn't this visceral hatred of, of the bailout until Rick Santelli got on television um, after, and this was Barack Obama had just put forward the Homeowner Affordability Act, which Tell was- Tell who he is so they know. Uh, Rick Santelli? Yeah. He's a business reporter on CNN, uh, CNBC, excuse me. Uh, and so he, he was doing this, uh, a live report from the Chicago Board of Exchange, is that right? Yeah. Uh, and, um, and I'll get to why that's funny in a moment too. Uh, but he was reacting to the news that Obama had put forward this program, the $75 billion program that was going to directly aid homeowners who were close to foreclosure. Now, people didn't react to the trillions of dollars that went to banks because it wasn't real for them. But the $75 billion, which was, again, about a, you know, a tenth or, or a twentieth of the, the bailout outlay up to that point, 
uh, was going to low-income uh, homeowners, largely minority homeowners, and it was their next door neighbors who were getting this money, uh, and that's why they got so ma so mad. And the other thing that was amazing about it was Santelli was giving this speech on the floor of the Chicago Board of uh, Exchange, and he, he was sort of doing it in front of this chorus. There were all these traders behind him, and he kept saying, "You know, America, are we going to stand for this?" And the America uh, responded with, you know, these shouts of boos and and whatnot. These were the same people who were driving up the commodities prices. These, these were commodities traders. Who were the, these were the speculators who, were, who had caused the gas prices spike in 2008. That was the, the America that, that was the backdrop for this incredible media-driven phenomenon, the Tea Party. And so it's, it was so perverse and bizarre on so many levels, but it, it, but it went around the country and it, and it provoked this incredible movement. It played to resentment. You know, do you want your neighbor having a, a nice bathroom, an extra bathroom in their house? Absolutely not. You know, so it just played on the people were getting, these people were getting away with something, but no reference to the banks getting away with a lot more. Uh, and of course, the failure to really uh, support the homeowners has led to this incredible foreclosure crisis, which is just deepening. You know, we have 794 banks now that are either insolvent or on the brink of collapse. So you, you have, a, you have a, a situation where the situation is getting worse, but you don't really get a sense of that very much in the media. It wasn't even much talked about during the election, was it? Right. With the exception of deficits. and. But it wasn't real to these people until it was people who were living next door to them. I mean, the, the Russians have this amazing joke that you know, a, a genie comes to a person and says, um, you know, he finds the bottle, genie comes out, genie says, I'll give you any wish you want, but the only catch is that your neighbor has to get twice as much. And the guy says, well, pluck out one of my eyes, you know? <laughs> uh, and that's, that to me perfectly encapsulated what the, the, the reaction to the bailouts was all about because it was just people, they, were, they had this uh, anger that had to go towards somebody and, and, the, and they, they couldn't allow themselves to be angry at rich people, they couldn't allow themselves to be angry at their own party. Uh, and so they had to be angry basically at low-income minority homeowners and that, that's where the anger went. Also, I mean, you didn't just, you know, focus on, you know, uh, minority homeowners. You went after the big poobah, you know, uh, Goldman Sachs. How did you come to get into this war with Goldman Sachs? Incidentally, that Goldman Sachs, in, in some respects, lost. But this was, uh, I had done um, the story about AIG uh, after the election, I, you know, I talked to my editors about that whole scene with McCain, and I said, we have to do a financial crisis story. We, we talked about it, and we did one that was on AIG that was kind of all about what that bailout was all about and what it caused the crisis, and it got this tremendous response afterwards, and, and we were kind of overwhelmed by it. We had originally only planned to do one, and so we were deciding you know, to what we were going to do for the second installment of it, and I started to notice that every single person I interviewed mentioned Goldman. It was, they were in the middle of every single narrative in this store, whether it was uh, commodities or, or mortgages or the internet stock bubble or, uh, it, you know, anything, political influence, uh, naked short selling, it didn't matter what it was, Goldman was somehow in there. And the other funny thing was, nobody just said Goldman Sachs. They always added some kind of modifier. It was always like, those motherfuckers at Goldman Sachs. Or, uh, and there was this hatred of uh, other Wall Street people, a lot of the people on Wall Street have this tremendous resentment uh, of Goldman because they feel like this is, these, this is the big uh, sort of monopolistic power that is unfairly beating them uh, in the markets. They're, they're using their, their size and their, their political influence to, to, to game the markets. And so I had this natural wellspring of sources, people who are in, in the business, I'm sure you have experiences too who want to talk about what goes on and they wanted to point the finger at Goldman and that, that made it a natural news subject to, to follow. But it wasn't just that, it was your phrase, you know, when you compared them to a giant vampire squid. Now, actually, I, I forget who it was, I guess the, the guy that wrote about, uh, uh, I'm blanking out now, the, you know, basically said, well, squids don't attach themselves to, to faces, therefore, oh, yeah, yeah. you know, therefore this is, you know, inaccurate or what have you. But <laughs> it seemed like, it seemed like a, a metaphor, you know, not, 
not to be judged on the level of factual accuracy, but nevertheless, that was the kind of techniques that were being used to discredit you. I actually had a funny story about that. I mean, we have obviously have fact checkers at Rolling Stone, and uh, we they fact check everything. You know, if I say the sky was blue, they say what sky? What really was it blue? Uh, and this, the 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 line was. Uh, Goldman Sachs is, is the great vampire squid wrapped around the face of humanity, relentlessly jamming its blood funnel into anything that smells like money. And the fact checkers, <laughs> they came to me, uh, I got a call in the middle of the night, and the guy's like, squids don't have blood funnels. And I said, <laughs> and I was like, it, that's part of what makes it funny that it doesn't really work that way. And he's like, oh, all right. So I just barely got that past the fact checkers. That was funny. But again, you know, the obsession with facts often undercuts uh, an obsession with meaning and what those facts and context and background and a way of connecting the dots in this story. So many people to this day uh, don't really see this, you know, don't really understand this story. They don't want to understand it somehow. They're in denial about it. They're in, you know, uh, I did a film called In Debt We Trust in 2006. Uh, warning of the credit collapse, okay? And I, it was basically the response was, you're an alarmist, you're a doom and gloomer, you, you're exaggerating, you know what you're talking about, shut the fuck up, etc. <laughs> and then, you know, seven months later, the markets collapsed, so it went from being a zero to a hero. You know, how did you know, you know, when so few others did? Which, which was, you know, of course I wasn't the only one making this argument, I was the only, but nobody was covering it or reporting it. And this is part of the problem. You made Goldman Sachs a subject, uh, a fair subject for inquiry, which led to uh, those hearings with Senator Levin and, and uh, you know, a character out of central casting, a Frenchman named Fab, you know, <laughs> Fabulous I mean, you, can't, Fab. you can't make this stuff up. And, and you write about it in this book. So talk a little bit about that, the reaction. You know, you, you took on this mega institution, you know, more powerful than governments, in fact, controlling governments. And yet, uh, you, a mere, you know, uh, writer for a rock and roll magazine, or what was perceived as a rock and roll magazine, A, get taken seriously, and B, the institution ends up paying $550 million. Yeah, that, it, it, uh, the, f the funny thing about the way the Goldman piece uh, unfolded, it's just, uh, I think most of the, the, the criticism that I got wasn't that you got this fact wrong or that fact wrong. It was really all about the tone of, of the piece. If you, if you dug into, if you actually read the things that people like Charlie Gasparino or, or Megan McArdle wrote uh, about, about my article. She uh, writes for the Atlantic. She writes for the Atlantic. Um, they, they really often would say things like, well, yes, it's true, Goldman had a, did this, or yes, it's true, Goldman was shorting the market while they were selling mortgages, but it, you know, that wasn't a bit, that big a deal. And they were, their, their whole point really boiled down to, well, Goldman wasn't the only one. Uh, if, when you, when everyone you, does it. Everyone does therefore, it, so therefore it's not that big a deal. And in my response, you know, so why, why pick on Goldman? And I said, be, you know, because I can, because it's their turn, you know. Uh, the, the, you know, we, uh, we picked one investment bank, and obviously there was a little bit of a, a literary strategy here to kind of make uh, a James Bondian villain out of somebody, because this material is difficult to swallow and dry, and you have to add a little bit of drama in order to get people to, to digest it. And there was a little bit of that in this piece, but that didn't mean that they were any less guilty or, or they, that they weren't guilty of the things that we were writing about in the piece. So um, I think that there was, there was that attitude that you're not supposed to, to be vicious when you when you talk about the people who are the producers of jobs in this country, and uh, I, the other thing I thought that was interesting is that um, I wrote about these these guys not having had a whole lot of personal contact with people who worked for Goldman Sachs, and I, I as I was writing the piece, I was imagining in my my mind's eye what they must be like according to their actions. And when we saw those hearings that you talk about, it was incredible that they, they actually were exactly the way that uh, one imagined them to be. Uh, the most striking characteristic, I thought, of, of those guys is that they really do believe in this notion that the more money we make, the, you know, what's good for Goldman Sachs is good for America, uh, is good for everybody. And this complete, completely unapologetic attitude, like, uh, you know, how, how dare you, they, they seem very put out that they ha even had to be come to answer questions in the Senate. And it's, 
a lot of people ask me, are they, do they really believe this stuff? Do they, do they really believe that, uh, that you know, unchecked greed is actually good for society? And it's not an act. I, they, when I, when I would later have the opportunity to meet a lot of these people, and it's absolutely true. That's act, that is act, exactly the way they are, which makes them great villains. I, I just want to clarify something, because your remarks here, you know, the guy from Fox News in the back, could be listening to those remarks and say, Taibi is admitting <laughs> that he falsified the story. Uh, and I don't, didn't hear that in what you just said. What, what I'm interested in is how sometimes, quote, the facts can get in the way of the truth because the facts are selectively chosen and not put into any sort of narrative that makes sense out of them. Yeah, I think I think there's bias in every news story. I think every newspaper chooses which facts to to include, which facts not to include, which facts to put high, which ones to put low, what to put in the headline, where to put the picture. This is this is all bias. I think if you're going to be biased, you should be out in front about it. And you know, I, I am. Uh, I think um, yeah, when I lived in Russia. Uh, one of the things I loved about Russian journalists is that um, their news reporters all wrote in the first person and they had personalities and you knew who they were. You, they, it was sort of like a, a relationship that you have with the reporters there. Uh, they let you know where, they were, know where they were coming from personally and that allowed you to make a decision to, about whether or not I trust this person to tell me this bit of news or not. And it's, you know, I'm not discounting entirely the way we do it here in America with that dry third person. Kind, we need that kind of reporting as well. But I think I think there's a place for that to, to sort of you know be a be a person so that people can relate to. We're going to open this up to questions from the floor. But you know before we do, I've been sort of treating you more or less as a, 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 you know a, a knower, an all you know a, an analyst, uh, somebody who's a journalist reporter, uh, you know kind of offering a, a synthesis of your argument. But it seems to me like in reading this book in the last hour, I see you as sort of an artist. I mean, I see you as somebody who's actually approaching this material with, a, with color, with tone, with temperament, with you know, insight. And I wondered if you would be willing to read a little something from I'm, the book. I'm a terrible you, reader. Maybe we should, we, should, we should probably pass on that. But. All right, well then let me suggest <laughs> then that when you pick one I up, you it. read it and read it aloud because I think you'll find it a very enjoyable experience. Now, not to keep you from the man, let's take some questions and maybe just give, me, give us your name so we know who you are. Yeah. Oh, okay. And, uh, he's, he's, I'm doing him next, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, there seems to be, on the coast, it's called a moderate, the words you use. Things are kind of crazy in the Midwest right now, and that's an underreported story, and, you know, anywhere from Detroit, Cleveland, Cincinnati, St. Louis, these are graveyards of cities. Oh, yeah. And, um, well, it, it, the, uh, I just got back from, I mean, I know it's not the Midwest, but I just got back from Jacksonville, Florida. I'm doing a thing on the foreclosure crisis, and it's unbelievable. Uh, it, uh, the, the total devastation, if you go anywhere in this country that's outside Manhattan, really, uh, it's striking. Even the changes in the last couple of years are, are striking, because I, you know, I always have to travel the country a lot for the, for the campaign reporting, but just in the last couple of years, whole sections of cities are you know now boarded up and and you know neighborhoods are half in foreclosure and it's it's an it's an amazing thing to see and, and I, I think you're right it's kind of an underreported phenomenon but that's kind of the way we cover the news we don't we don't really you know show poverty on tv that much and connections are often aren't made if one house goes into a foreclosure uh, you know, down go the property values that affects the house across the street, affects the tax base, affects the schools, affects the police, affects the libraries, affects the schools. Uh, in other words, the ripple of all of this, you, you might be up to date on your mortgage, but you're going to be pulled down by all of this. And by the way, in case you haven't heard, Dennis Kucinich was reelected uh, from uh, Ohio, so uh, from Cleveland. Uh, other questions? In the back, yeah. Me? Yeah. Hey, my name's Matt. Hi, Matt. I'm a native of Wisconsin. I'm oh. today because of fine gold. I am. But I, I came out here to get my MBA at Columbia, actually, and I 
I just want to totally agree with you on what the Wall Street people, how they view the world. <laughs> <laughs> I went to school with them, and as a Midwesterner who moved out here, it was kind of a huge surprise to me. Just that whole attitude. I mean, maybe we're more simple there. I don't know what it really is, but I like to think that it's just something that most of the country doesn't understand. And I, I wonder what you think it'll take to kind of cut the legs out from under that, because it's been growing for a while. And it seems like the government is doing much about it. Yeah, uh, I, first of all, I just got back from Wisconsin yesterday. I was in I was in Madison, uh, a great place. I have family out there. Where were you? Where, what city are you from? I grew up in Milwaukee. Milwaukee. Okay, cool. Um, I think you know, as I I've been doing a lot, obviously a lot of traveling, and I increasingly come across people who do get what's going on here, but that's because they've personally. Uh, had a confrontation with Wall Street some way. They either got wiped out by credit card debt or they got foreclosed upon uh, or they lost, uh, you know, 40 percent of their pension funds value because, uh, you know, a bunch of bankers and, and, and Wall Street sold their pension fund worthless mortgage-backed securities. Uh, people are beginning, they're being forced to learn about this stuff uh, because it's affecting them personally. And I, I think Unfortunately, that's probably what's going to happen the, the, because nobody's stepping up and doing the job of, of educating people. I thought the Democrats had a great opportunity uh, after Barack Obama got elected. Uh, the, the economy was in complete collapse. The Republican Party was completely uh, in disarray and discredited. And there was an opportunity there for this teaching moment to kind of tell everybody, hey, this is what went down in the last 10 years. You were a victim. Uh, these people over here did this. Uh, but they didn't do that. They kind of like took a fork in the road and decided they wanted to keep that constituency, uh, you know, as a, as campaign contributors. And so there's no there's no big political mouthpiece out there doing that job, and that's 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 kind of the problem. You know, just uh, on as a student at Columbia, you might be interested. I don't know if you've seen this film, Inside Job. My film focuses on journalism, how journalism was complicit, how the media was complicit with the financial crisis. But they go after the academics. And they go after the Columbia Business School, which just received a hundred million dollar, uh, you know, uh, in, you know, in, in money from a some sort of a private equity, uh, you know, a thief. And I think it would be interesting for you to check that out about how, in a sense, the economics profession and these schools of business have been taken over. You know, I think James Galbraith made the point, you know, that out of a 15,000 members of the American Economics Association, only 15 sort of saw this whole thing, saw this bubble building and saw this whole crash coming. So, uh, you know, the people who are supposed to be in the know are often the least of informed about any of this. Other questions? Yeah. Hi, I'm Philip Duncan. Um, I mean, you're talking about, like, the way that people aren't, like, aren't educated and, like, the Democrats haven't been able to educate people about this. Like what, I feel like on a basic level, like what the bailouts were all about is, and, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, but they gave money to the big guys to lend out to everybody else. And, and they justified it by saying, you're not going to be able to get a car loan, you're not going to be able to get a home loan. Right. So we've got to give money to this middleman to jack up the interest rates and then lend it out. So why, why couldn't they just like just say this is a middleman? Like we're, we're giving money to a middleman. Well, that was the ostensible justification for the bailouts. I mean, I even talked to Paul Kanjorski, the congressman from Pennsylvania. He said, when we did these bailouts, we sat down with these guys from Wall Street. We said, there is an implicit agreement here. We give you, we're going to give you this money now. We're going to save your asses now. And you're going to kickstart the economy again and put people to work. And what they did is they, we gave them the money now, and they kept it. You know, that, that was basically what happened. If you, if you look at uh, what happened in 2009, the, the, the banks that had been showered with bailout money, uh, they all came and they, they, they said that we feel apprehensive about this economy. We don't want to lend in this environment because it's too uncertain. We're not sure about the health care plan and what the costs are going to be, so they went, therefore we're not investing. And they immediately started setting aside massive amounts of money for bonuses. Uh, you know, Goldman Sachs, which was on the verge of, of collapse, which was, would have gone out of business in September 2008 without a bailout, uh, had a, a bonus pool that was uh, well above $4 billion in the first quarter of 2009. Uh, so there was, we gave them all this money, uh, and there was that deal where they were supposed to lend it to us, but instead uh, they kept it. The other part of that, I'm sorry to make this a long answer, is we 
slashed interest rates down to basically zero, uh, the Fed did, and made it possible for these banks to essentially borrow money for free. And in, in banking, cost of capital is everything. If, you're, if, you're, if you can borrow money for nothing, then it's almost impossible not to make money. A lot of these banks were borrowing at zero, were turning right around and lending the money back to the U.S. government at 3%. Uh, but what people don't realize is when they slashed those interest rates down to, to nothing, it was ordinary people who had CDs and savings accounts, suddenly they're not earning interest uh, on, on their savings. All these people who did the right thing by saving uh, and, and not blowing their money on speculative bubbles uh, got punished and we rewarded the people who did exactly the wrong thing. And these are the kinds of things, again, we didn't, we didn't explain to people. You said earlier that you had been a, in Russia. Mm -hmm. I mean, are, are you interested or, or have any comment on the fact that the word oligarch, <laughs> which was used and is used in Russia, is now sort of being used here to describe oh, financial yeah. titans? I, I, I see that parallel all the time. It, it kind of had a profound influence. Uh, you know, the, the loans for shares scandal in 1996 in Russia was this thing where they, the, uh, this, they were privatizing the big jewels of Russian industry, so they handed these billion-dollar uh, you know, companies like Norilsk Nickel and Sedanko, these giant oil companies, they handed them to these gangsters who were friends of Yeltsin. Uh, <laughs> these people were made billionaires overnight. They immediately took that money and gave it right back to Boris Yeltsin's uh, re-election campaign, and that's how he won in 1996. And that whole circular thing, give thief money, thief gives money back to government, and they keep each other in power. That's exactly the narrative that we're dealing with here. It's, we bailed these guys out, they're going to give the, uh, these same politicians campaign contributions, and it's going to be the same endless cycle. It's an exact parallel. You know, for all these years, though, you know, people have pointed to Africa and said, you know, you have a kleptocracy in Africa. They're just stealing. It seems like the, the level of theft in this country makes them look like rank amateurs. Uh, in fact, Transparency International just uh, did an international, you know, kind of ordering of the corrupt nations of the world. And I think the U.S. was number 20 or 19. Yeah, it's funny. I, I remember what Kissinger once said about the Soviet Union, which he described it as upper volta with rockets. And, uh, and that's kind of, to me, that's what we are now, you know, upper volta with rockets. Yes, go ahead. I, I don't. I, I think that their mandate is going to be just obfuscatory. They're they're going to they're going to make a show of trying to roll back, for instance, the health care program, but they, they can't do it obviously because they don't have the Senate and the president's still in the White House. So they're going to they're going to do a whole lot of things that are going to try to play to their base, and and none of them are going to. There's going to be complete and total gridlock. Uh, I, I, I don't know exactly what they're going to do, um, but it, it's, it's, I'm sure it's not going to be pretty. So <laughs> still, mate, mate, yeah. yeah. Um, we talked earlier about, I mean, Henry, we were talking earlier about the left and the White House trying to educate the public about what, how things went wrong and who's responsible for them. And the news media has been really pushing the women on the right as this, the news topics of the last couple of years, but there are two people, two women on the left or center, I think, are sort of quintessential to the not in educating or educating the country. Elizabeth Warren's political career may just be starting in full, and then Blanche Lincoln has just died in a uh, back alleyway somewhere. Right. I was wondering what you guys think about both of these sort of oddly now. Well, first of all, I love Elizabeth Warren. I think, well, not, I don't love her that way. Uh, is, my, is my wife here yet? Uh, Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth Warren is uh, a fantastic person, and I think she's an example of the kind of politician that is going to be needed in the future because um, there are very few people, politicians, who are out there who are literate uh, in, in all these issues. Uh, I can think of only a couple. Uh, you know, Ted Kaufman comes close, but he's not at, at her level. Uh, Elliot Spitzer, who's, of course, no longer a politician. Uh, I don't know, Joel, can you think of anybody else? Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's interesting <laughs> about Elizabeth Warren. You know, she is a bankruptcy expert. You know, this is, can't think of anything more boring, you know, than a bankruptcy expert. And yet, she became uh, uh, not only a, a force, 
that that forced the administration, even you know, and the Democratic Party, how diluted as they did, uh, to actually come up with this Consumer Protection Bureau now in the Federal Reserve Bank. But she was one of the few people who could go on television, whether it was Oprah or The Daily Show or or wherever, and explain this in a really clear, practical way, and and you know, in an engaging way, uh, without a lot of ideological. You know, uh, you know, ov overcharging of the issues, and I think that she it was very hard for the people who wanted to dismiss her to do so because she was that good. Sure, and and uh, again, this this stuff is so arcane. When I when I researched this book, the people who I talked to who knew about mortgages didn't know about commodities. I would ask them a question about how the commodities market would work. None of them know. Uh, this this stuff is all it's highly specific, and and in order to have a, an overview of all of it like she does, it's, uh, it's a very rare person who has that kind of background. Now, now, great story in this book, which you may or may not know. Uh, anybody here from Chicago? Nobody. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I visited Sorry, Chicago. New York is doing it too. Uh, in, in June, and uh, I was struck by, you know, that the meters, the meters had doubled in price. You know, there's a little flashback, but the Cuban Revolution was triggered in part by Batista giving the parking meters in Havana to the mafia who ran it and collected all the money themselves. So the first act of the Cuban Revolution was to tear down the parking meters <laughs> in Havana. Now, fast forward to Chicago. Uh, the parking meters in Chicago were sold uh, to people from Abu Dhabi and, and other investors, and you write about this brilliantly in this book. I didn't know the backstory. Tell us about it because it's fascinating. I had, a, I had a guy who works for, a, you know, anyone know what a sovereign wealth fund is? They're just these, they're these foreign government run funds or think of them as a sort of giant state hedge funds uh, and countries like Saudi Arabia and the United Arab, Arab Emirates, they have these big pools of money. Singapore. That, Singapore. Uh, they have these big pools of money that they get usually from selling natural resources and then they these funds go off all around the world in search of investments to make themselves bigger. Um, I have a, fr a friend who worked uh, at a Middle Eastern wealth fund and he called me up one day and so he had the weirdest thing happen. A bunch of American bankers showed up in our office and we had a presentation where they tried to sell me and my bosses the Pennsylvania Turnpike. They had a... Uh, <laughs> Uh, a slide projector, they sat down, you have to picture this scene with a whole bunch of sh sheiks sitting on one side of the table and a bunch of bankers, I believe it was Morgan Stanley on the other side of the table, who were like, look at how great the toll booths are, they're all clean, you know, the highways don't have cracks in them. And this guy was telling me this whole story about how uh, these, all these things are for sale. And then it turns out that we're doing this all over the country, uh, these public-private partnerships. Uh, where in a, what happens is a, gov a, a state or a, or a local government will get into a budget crisis and in order to patch the hole for that year, they'll sell 75 years worth of revenue from some state infrastructure. And in Chicago, they had a budget problem and so they sold all the parking meters in Chicago to a consortium of investors that was led by an American investment bank. And what they always do is they have, they do it through an American investment bank who then puts a Western-run front company in charge of servicing all these properties, but the investors in all of this are foreigners. And, the, and in this case, the, a lot of them were foreigners from the Middle East uh, who made sure that their stakes were 25, 26 percent. There were no majority owners, so we didn't know who they were. And this is going on all over the country, and nobody knows about it. When I talked to the Speaker of the House in Pennsylvania, I said, oh, well, how do you feel about them trying to sell the Pennsylvania Turnpike to a bunch of guys in, in the UAE, and he goes, they did that? You know? I mean, he had, he had no idea. This is the, the, the Speaker of the House in Pennsylvania had no idea that this was going on. The Alderman in Chicago had no idea this was going on. Well, you know, but it's the implications of all of this in terms of publicly held property uh, being transferred to uh, private firms, and in Chicago, they, you know, they did this deal where they kind of underestimated significantly the revenues for Chicago from these parking meters. So, you know, the Chicago is making all, some money, but these guys made five times as much uh, on this deal. It was a really bad deal for the people of Chicago. And the situation in Chicago is not just that there are parking meters, but that cars are towed, you know, fast. 
you know, they're kind of cruising up the street and they start to, so the people who really get s snared in this are the people who can afford it the least. And that's, again, uh, how financial analysis here and these colorful, funny stories come back to ordinary people getting screwed. Uh, and, and often that's not reported, and that's what I think is very um, important about, about you know, Matt's work, because he doesn't lose that dimension of, you know, of, of, of the analysis of who, who wins and who loses, who benefits and who doesn't. And I think that that is very important, and it's a standard that we have to confront journalists with. You know, are, are they explaining this in a way, or are they mystifying it and obscuring it with all kinds of, you know, uh, language that's so impenetrable and so dense that nobody can understand it, and they just tune out and turn off. And I think part of the way they could get away with all this is that it was so c it was made unduly complex. Uh, you know, the, these uh, mortgage-backed securities, the securitization machine, uh, you know, the ratings agencies, so many different. Uh, elements in all of this and and so it's hard for people to realize this is a heist going on in front of our eyes this is the biggest crime in history yes you oh. disagree I mean, the, I mean, the tea party is kind of an easy target right now but what do you make of a term is an oligarch if anything mike bloomberg attempted to paint himself as the bipartisan moderate to try to interject himself into the uh, 2012 election? I, I don't know. Uh, you know, given... He goes to you, Jersey City. Yeah, <laughs> know about Bloomberg, you, know. you know, to be perfectly honest, when I look at Christine O'Donnell and Sarah Palin, Mike Bloomberg doesn't even seem that bad to me. I, I, I think, I think uh, you know, as a minimum standard, sanity uh, and, and a fourth grade education. Uh, you know, if we do better than that, I'm going to be happy, basically. And uh, you know, Bloomberg, look, he's a he's a you know a billionaire, and and uh, uh, obviously he his news agency didn't do a tremendously excellent job on on uh, on this crisis, and he has his own int financial interests. But I don't know. I think we could do worse. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi, Sharad. Hi, Sharad. Oh, I th you know, clearly after the crash in 2008, they they surveyed the landscape and they made a decision that well we can either put people back to work or we can we can save Wall Street and hope that they put pe people back to work and they made the decision to to rescue Wall Street and so what we have now is this jobless recovery where the the stock markets are humming along again the even those high yield mortgage backed bonds are all recovering and. Uh, you know, everybody who is who's in that world is starting to do well again. The banks are making big profits, um, but as the same thing that happened in the middle part of the last decade is, you know, this obscured the fact that there were severely overrated assets on the balance sheets of all these companies, and eventually that's going to come out, and that's going to result in another another correction for all of us. Uh, I don't see any evidence, and at least in the people who who work in, in Wall Street tell me that there really isn't any evidence that we're actually recovering in any real way in any in the, that our industry is actually recovering they tell us that we're having a financial recovery uh, that if you own the this, this this and that asset that you might see your portfolio go have seen your portfolio go up recently but that doesn't mean that people are going back to work and I, I just don't see it happening you, well the, yeah. the IMF just made a really had issued a study the International Monetary Fund. Usually, the argument is unemployment is caused because there's there's you know jobs are people with, don't have the skill set to get the jobs, and there's this growing gap between people who can do the work and the jobs that are available. Hence, unemployment isn't it bad? Uh, they went and they looked at the relationship of unemployment to foreclosures which in a recent report, which is fascinating, basically saying that that is more responsible uh, for the unemployment. 
And the, the actual pain that people are experiencing, the frustration that they have in trying to get somebody in the bank to answer the phone, to try to get uh, you know, a promised modification of their mortgage to actually happen, you know, they're tearing apart the lives of so many people. And most of us are insulated from it. The humanity of all of this tends to get lost. I was, went to an event sponsored by a group called NACA, the Neighborhood Assistance Corporation of America in Washington, D.C. And they put out an announcement, you know, if you need help with your mortgages, we'll give you free counseling. And they, they did it at a hotel on 16th Street in Washington, D.C. They expected about 2,000 people. 20,000 people came, surrounded the hotel for five days and five nights, okay? Uh, desperate. And these were, not un these were not homeless people, but people didn't want to be homeless people. People who worked for the city, for the metro in Washington, for uh, you know, uh, various uh, government agencies, even some teachers, some lawyers were there, all with their mortgage papers, trying to figure out what to do, how to respond. And you know, I was down there you know, uh, covering all this, and I noticed that across the street from the hotel is the offices of the Washington Post. So the Washington Post didn't cover this. And this is actually literally, they have to open the window and look out and see all these people surrounding uh, you know, this hotel, which is across the street. So I, I went over there, and I ran into a friend of mine. He said, oh, gee, we didn't know about it. Nobody sent us a press release. Uh, <laughs> and you know, finally, they came and reported it on the very last day. If they had reported it earlier, I'm sure it would have been 50,000 people in Washington. And when you see... The, the, the level, you know, it really is a depression feeling, you know, of, of people who are, you know, don't know what to do, essentially. Yeah, just to follow up on that quickly, I, I'm doing a foreclosure story now, and I just saw, I, I was looking at some statistics that um, there are up to 11 million uh, people who are in danger of foreclosure, which means there's a long way down. We still have to go in terms of housing prices and if, and. and and uh, lost value, uh, not just for houses, but for mortgage-backed securities, which are in everything, which, mean there's, which means that there's a long way down for the economy mm -hmm. to still go. So that, to, to answer your question, it's there. And also, I would just add that this whole thing we're hearing about robo-signers, you know, machines signing foreclosures and, and, and the rest of it, these abuses which the courts are finally uh, being confronted with, don't deal with the abuses at the front end when these people were sold mortgages that were worthless and talked into to taking them on uh, and found themselves pretty soon in unaffordable s situations, right. which the people selling it knew they would be, having analyzed their financial condition. Anyway, I think we're. I think we have time for two more, sir. Hi, uh, Nick. Right. But is, is, I think part of it is also that the relationships that financial reporters have to maintain on Wall Street for sure. trumps the ability to actually criticize. I'm, like, I'm flashing back on that interview. It was with Maria Bartiromo. <laughs> yeah, that was a relationship. Right. So Citibank. Well, I mean, I, I'm in a. <laughs> He's a bomb I, <laughs> I think I think in in, uh, in journalism, it's obviously a very difficult thing. Every journalist has to worry about the, the you know, keeping friends, uh, because every time you do a story, uh, it, it turns out even truths that seem harmless to you can cut really hard to people that you're writing about, uh, even if it's one shade off what they were what they what their vision of themselves is. So every time you write a story about anybody, if you if you're telling the absolute truth, you're going to lose friends. That's just part of the business. Um, uh, you know, I'm in a position where I don't have a, a specific beat, uh, and so I'm not dependent upon the same group of sources all the time. And and even though even in some places where I, I do kind of try to cultivate sources, I, I have lost a lot of friends over years. Like, for instance, in, in Congress, there are some places where they don't return my phone calls anymore. But that's, that's, a, you know, that's part of the, the job. I mean, I think, I think when you get too close to, to your sources, it's, it's really problematic. And there's an ethical issue there that you know, a lot of journalists struggle with. 
to answer your question. We're going to take a last question here, and then uh, Matt's going to sign books uh, over here. I, I'm, I'm going to just announce a little campaign that I'm involved in called the jail out campaign instead of the bailout campaign, where we're doing a national internet petition to try to uh, call for a full investigation, the indictment of, of people who are financial criminals, uh, their prosecution, and their incarceration. So if you're interested in that, you can chat with me as well, because we're trying to, I'm trying to, as a journalist, also try to be a bit of an activist on this issue. But let's, uh, let's hear from this last question, then let's give Matt a big hand. Hi. David. Hi, David. Thanks for coming. I Thank think you. you're a badass, and I think you're pros. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, Thanks. Uh, so we, we've kind of talked about like how there's incredible uh, wealth inequality, and the really rich guys who have a lot of the money, they have the media by the balls, and they have the politicians by the balls, and because we need to get a car loan, in a lot of cases, they have us by the balls. Mm -hmm. Do you see any of those things changing short of like, I mean, is an internet petition going to do it? Or like, uh, is, is it going to have to be like World War III or <laughs> any, any thoughts? Uh, it's a really good question. Uh, but one thing that I started to think about as I was writing this book is that it occurred to me that all of these people are completely dependent upon the people who they owe money to. I mean, who, who, who owe them money. Uh, they, there are these millions of people who are in foreclosure. Uh, what if they all stayed in their homes? What if they all, what if they all went to the courts and demanded that all of these people produce their paperwork uh, to show that, where, uh, you know, that they actually own these notes? Uh, what if all the people who owed credit card debt just decided, screw it, I'll take the bad, the bad uh, FICO score and you can, you can you know, hold on to that debt, you can keep it. Uh, these people, uh, they're all desperate. Uh, they have an, an incredible stake in, in the financial survival of, of the entire country. Because if everybody goes d bankrupt, if everybody defaults, um, you know, lo the losses on their books are going to be massive. Uh, so there's really a game of chicken that's, that's going on between all these debtors, these individual debtors out there, and these massive banks that are, that are trying desperately to conceal uh, the losses that they've already understood are going to happen at some point. Um, so people have a lot more power over these financial companies than they realize. Um, you know, it's like that old adage. You know, if, if you uh, if you owe a dollar, you have a problem. But if you owe, you know owe a million dollars, the bank has a problem. Uh, and the, you know these people have a huge problem. Uh, and they're we have to make them more invested in our survival. One of the problems with the foreclosure crisis is that the, the these banks are not actually um, the we, they don't actually, uh, they weren't actually the lenders of most of these mortgages. They were, they were taking money from in the investors in those mortgage-backed securities. So when you pay your mortgage every month, they're paying that, that whole amount into a trust that they owe money to. So when you only pay part of your mortgage, they owe the rest of that, the, the difference, out of their own pocket to the trust. That's why they're all desperate to foreclose, uh, because modification doesn't do it for them. They're going to end up owing 30 or 40 percent to, the, to their investors. Uh, so we have to get people connected back to, uh, to the, you know, there's a, a confluence of interest between the investors and all these assets and, and the people who actually ended up getting these loans. And this, these banks are just in the middle. Uh, and I think if we can, we, eventually there might be a way to sort it all out and, and return some sanity to it. Just uh, finally, there's also the Borowitz option. I don't know if you saw Andy Borowitz's column today reporting that 55 million Americans are seeking citizenship in Canada as a result of the election. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for coming. Let's give Matt Taibbi a big hand. And also this wonderful bookstore uh, for putting on this event.